um, Professor Callum Sample, and, and, and um, some of you heard uh, Callum's talk yesterday. Callum is a consultant in pediatric respiratory medicine at Alderhead Children's Hospital. He led a WHO mission to Ebola crisis in 2014. His research interests include investigating the clinical and immunological factors associated with severe respiratory infections. Um, we got Professor Stephen Riley. Um, uh, Stephen is a Professor of Infectious Disease Dynamics at Imperial College London. Steve studies the transmission of human pathogens. He conducts studies analyzing the data, use of mathematical models to look at the scientific questions that are relevant to the public health. So how does our pattern of social context affect the transmission of respiratory infection? how much severe is one strain of influenza than the others, and how far does the influenza penetrate into the rural areas after it sweeps through. We have also got Dr. James Rubin. James is an academic psychologist at King's College London, where he's a reader in the psychology of emerging health risk. His main research interest is an understanding of how people perceive health risks and what implications these perceptions have on and how people behave for their physical and mental well being. And we've got uh, Dr. Malur Sudhavna. Uh, so, uh, Sudhavna is a good friend uh, uh, and is a consultant biologist at King's. He has, uh, is a clinical director of pathology at the Wirepads at King's College Hospital. Um, he has been, um, last week, been appointed as a clinical lead at the Milton Keynes Mega Lab for UK mass text, uh, testing for COVID-19 with the aim to do 100,000 samples a day. So um, maybe if I um, let um, each panel member speak uh, for, uh, for two to three minutes about COVID-19 and, 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 then, um, um, and then people can start asking the questions uh, in, in, through the Q&A chat and then we can try to address the questions based on it. So maybe I just go in that order, start with you, Callum. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be presenting once again to you. Uh, it's been a very busy day with uh, coronavirus research today. The clinical characterization protocol in the United Kingdom recruited its 5,000th patient today, uh, albeit that the vast majority of these patients, uh, 4,500 of them, are data only collections of deep, a deep data dig. Uh, 500 of them have agreed with consent to give biological samples. Uh, these biological samples get distributed very quickly to research partners. Public Health England has been the major recipient so far. Um, it might surprise you that Public Health England needs to get these samples, but in fact, most of what they get through the usual channel is uh, swabs, and we can provide them with the serum that's needed to validate their assays. We also provide uh, the virus to colleagues at Bristol University and Glasgow University uh, to culture it. We're providing material to commercial organisations to develop assays, and uh, we're also providing uh, the nucleic acid for sequencing for uh, molecular epidemiology work. And we provide material to a thing called the National Institute for Biological Standards and Controls to make the world standards. And this week we've shipped to all of these partners. So we've been quite busy here in Liverpool. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Steve. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, yeah. As you've, uh, as you've already introduced me, my name is Stephen Riley. I'm part of the Imperial College um, COVID-19 response team. Um, we are using kind of data from around the world, including the UK, uh, analytics and modeling uh, to try and generate evidence that's useful for the response. Um, we've been involved since quite early on. Um, so we looked at um, very early on based on the, the pattern of exported cases. We estimated how big the outbreak uh, was in Wuhan when uh, when it was being reported as only a small number of cases locally. 
Um, we've done quite a few reports since then. Um, in particular, we've looked um, we've looked at the severity of infection, so uh, estimating what the the case fatality rate as and in fact the infection fatality rate uh, as a function of age. That's been part of the kind of important work we've looked at. We've looked at a lot of interventions, um, mainly from a, well from a planning perspective, and then more recently um, in a kind of an, a, an assessment uh, in more of an assessment framework. Um, and I think. It, the in terms of the dynamics and the epidemiology, um, the, the kind of very interesting aspects of this in children um, are obviously that it's much less severe in children um, than it is in older age groups. There is now growing evidence that it's not just severity, but also reduced susceptibility. Children, the, the evidence is not completely clear on this, but the emerging picture is that children um, are far less likely to get infected if exposed. Um, and then there's maybe even a little bit of evidence accumulating about infectiousness of children, but that's that's uh, much less clear. Um, so that's kind of what we've done. And then right now, what we're most interested in, along with everyone else, is trying to assess the impact um, of the ongoing interventions, especially those in the UK. So that's kind of where we are right now. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Dr. James Rubin. Thanks and hi all. Um, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a psychologist. I'm based at King's College London. Um, I'm particularly interested, as you, as you said, in how people understand various toxic nasties. And I've done everything from people's perceptions of Wi-Fi through to anthrax, through to uh, the current pandemic and how what you believe about uh, infections or about hazardous risks influences your behavior and how that then has knock-on implications for your exposure um, and also for your psychological well-being. Um, so in the context of the current pandemic, we're, we're particularly interested in people's adherence to current behavioural recommendations. Um, my team and I, we've done three systematic reviews so far looking at what influences adherence to quarantine. And we've looked at previous studies from SARS, Ebola, swine flu and MERS, looking at rates of adherence to quarantine and also what can we do to improve uptake of those measures? Um, we've looked at the psychological impact of quarantine. So if you lock people away for two weeks, does that have implications for people's mental health? Um, and the conclusion seems to be quite clear that it does, although quantifying that is slightly harder. Um, and the studies we've looked at, importantly, only go up for about two weeks of quarantine. So the implications of the current measures that last for much longer than that are, are interesting. Um, and we've also done stuff looking at school closures. So in particular, what happens to children when you close a school? Where do they go? Do they continue to mingle with each other? Um, and again, what can we do to help parents to stop those interactions from happening? So that's the stuff we've done looking at previous incidents. Um, at the moment, we're very interested on population surveys um, and trying to understand at a population level what members of the public are doing, whether they're adhering to advice, um, and what we can do to bolster adherence and to maintain it over the long term. Thank you, James. And um, uh, Sudhavna. Hi, thank you very much for inviting me. So I'm actually talking to you from Milton Keynes, the biocenter where we are about to do the, we will launch the UK mass testing. So the history of testing, this is for UK particularly. So somewhere in January, the Public Health England devised the assay, which is a PCR assay. On 1st of February, they gave the controls to the Public Health England labs and the devolved administrations in Scotland, Northern Ireland, and in Wales. And this is primarily the big labs like Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, Newcastle, Southampton, Bristol, and Cambridge. Um, on 25th of February, they, rolled it, they gave the controls to four or five NHS labs in the country. And uh, of course, we started seeing cases in the community by that time. And we went live on 29th of February with the seven samples a day capacity. And now in Kings, we're talking about 1000 samples a day capacity. We've been testing staff, we've been testing healthcare workers of all sorts from our hospital and in the families as is a guidance. And now I am entrenched in a mass testing facility in UK Biocenter where the project started on Wednesday and today is 
uh, Thursday, last Wednesday started. So the construction began, the construction finished yesterday and the capacity here today is 1000 by Saturday, Sunday will be around 3000. So these are all figures that are government, the, the capacity that we have and it'll, ex I mean, we cannot predict beyond three or four days how much more we're going to expand. The expansion is going to be 100,000 per day. It will cover every healthcare worker in UK. And the same thing will be replicated in Manchester and in Glasgow. And that's the plan. So here I am. Oh, thank you very much. Maybe I start with um, Callum. Um, Callum, just imagine you're on call uh, for pediatric respiratory. You receive a phone call from ITU consultant and they've got um, 14 year old, uh, previously well ventilated and is not doing well. So based on the current treatment, what is available or the options which are available, I know there is no huge amount of evidence at all to give COVID-19. Would you recommend any additional treatment or any medication which they should not be giving? At, at the moment, I would not dare to suggest anything as an academic professor in outbreak medicine when an intensivist who is experienced in supportive care will have far greater knowledge of how to manage the case. The, the reality is that academia has not provided any answers to these questions in this outbreak and it's our, our great responsibility to investigate the potential therapies using well-conducted controlled trials. The only information that I've seen so far is that placing people prone appears to be very good and that early mechanical ventilation is probably superior to non-invasive ventilation and high flow oxygenation. But um, I have the highest regard for my colleagues in intensive care. Uh, I would probably be the last person that they would phone wanting advice on how to manage their patients. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kellen. Um, maybe I, I ask Steve, uh, so how did this start and how far do you feel we have come So we know that it started in the city of Wuhan around the beginning of December. Um, it seems li most likely it was associated with um, the seafood market. It's called a seafood market, but it sells lots of different food types. Um, although the exact case data from the very beginning is, is probably not that clear. Um, I think it, we can summarize how far we've come kind of by working our way outwards from Wuhan. So um, we've seen one of the most astounding public health responses to anything ever, um, regardless of, of any value judgment of, of how different cultures would handle this thing, the, the net effect of the Chinese public health response to the initial outbreak in Wuhan is, uh, was absolutely incredible. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the virus has seeded pretty much all over the world since then. And so as we work outwards from there, um, we've seen some countries go into very, very fast lockdown uh, situations like Singapore to, Singapore to some degree, Hong Kong to some degree, South Korea, and achieve very low levels of incidence with a combination of lockdown and more sophisticated interventions. And then we've seen many other countries um, have varying degrees of stringency in their interventions um, from Italy and Spain, the UK, um, and now looking at the US. And then um, the kind of the the final piece of the of the overall picture is looking to uh, middle income and lower income countries, which have been seeded slightly more slowly because of their lower connectivity, um, and they're facing a whole set of slightly different challenges. So that's a very quick cartoon of uh, of how we started and where we are. Thank you. Uh, James, uh, school closures. There was a lot of debate about the school closure, and 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 what are the implications? So how long can you close the school for? Because then there are some public health advantage of closing the school due to the infection, but then there are you start running into the other problems when you close down the school, uh, and 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 the second was. Um, how long can you lock the, down the people for? Because at some time people will get fed up and, and, and they will start 
rebelling. So, and we have seen this recently in Italy uh, in some of the press reports. So how long can you lock it down for? Sorry, so this, the school closures, you're right. It's, it's normally a massively disruptive thing to do to close schools. It, it impacts society on all sorts of levels. So the education of the children, obviously, although with online lessons now, that there are some ways around that. My, my children are currently struggling downstairs with their online lessons. So if you hear shouting in the background, that's their math lesson going on. Um, the, it has impacts on the workforce, obviously. Um, there, are, there are ways to try and mitigate that. So in the UK, we have more of a, a school dismissal, a partial dismissal rather than a closure, um, which means that the schools remain open, the premises remain open and some children are allowed to remain within the premises as a kind of childcare rather than a, a formal educational setting. So there are ways to tackle it and try to mitigate some of the, some of the implications. Um, it's also a slightly different kettle of fish in the current context, because normally you'd worry about the disruption of the school closure because it keeps parents out of the workforce. But there's currently a lot of parents out of the workplace anyway because they're being asked to work from home if at all possible. So the complexities of the current situation means it's, it's not always possible to draw direct parallels from the, the way we've used these kind of measures in the past. Um, in terms of people rebelling and how long you can keep these things going for, um, again, it's, it's a slightly unknown quantity and it's a bit of a debate. I think one thing that factors into this a lot is um, risk perceptions among the public. So if people see that there's still a high level of threat from coronavirus, and particularly if people see that the interventions that are put in place are effective, and if that's well communicated to people, I suspect that we'll see quite high motivation to continue with the interventions for some time. There will still be practical problems, and maybe we can talk about this later as well. Um, but if we can get around the practical problems, issues like finding ways to get money or get funding through to people who are furloughed, um, making sure that there's still some level of social interaction, that some kind of exercise can still take place. If we can chip away at the practical problems, I think people's motivation to maintain the interventions could be quite high. Thank you very much, James. Um, so the Havna, there's, there's a lot of, um, I was speaking to Eckhart yesterday, uh, and he, Eckhart is based in Germany. And his view was that they are seeing a very different mortality rate uh, because they came very early in and they started testing people much more higher than what UK has. So do you think we now have to do things differently in next few weeks? Because still we are going to test with healthcare workers and not whole of the population. And, and, and the sensitivity of the swab test uh, what, what, could you comment on the sensitivity of the swab test as well? Yes, I saw that question earlier. Yeah, thanks. So there are various ways to test. We know the PCR, we have the antigen, and we have the antibodies. So uh, I will not discuss the antigens at the moment because it's uh, antigens are relevant if the virus is mutating a lot. And also quite often it's quite be quite cheap. But then there are inherent problems with antigen testing where you will get false positives, false negatives, and because antigen must have to be neutralized. So there are issues with antigen. Unless it's actually good to go, I wouldn't recommend antigen at the moment. But probably later on, once we develop some time on that, uh, experience on that. The antibodies, again, it's all being evaluated in UK at the moment. So I won't go into that later on, but you know the principles of IgG and IgM. Let's focus totally on the PCR. So yes, I think in UK, we started, uh, the assays were there. We started a bit late, uh, but I think the acceleration is happening in our own lab. For example, last week, two weeks ago, we were testing 200. That was our capacity. Now our capacity is 1,000. Every university, has, uh, university department where there are machines, where the PCR machines are there, they're all coming together and they're building up uh, resilience, they're building up the assays. Um, then you have this mass testing that's happening and where it's going to start. If you only reach this 100,000, we'll be able to cover people. In Germany, from what I gather, 
they are at 500,000 PCRs a day. So if you look at simple mathematics, the German population is 80 million or something. So in about two days, you're going to cover 1 million. But so it will take at least 160 days to cover. But that is why, because they're testing so much, they're testing the symptomatic. And that's why they're able to, their denominator is so big. If you look at American data from one year, one month ago, their mortality was like seven or eight percent. And that's because they did not have enough number of tests, the kids, they were rationing it, they were giving it to the people who were admitted. So the, the denominator was not reflecting what was happening. It, the number of tests in US, for example, was just the tip of the iceberg, the ICUs, the admitted, the people who had insurance, all these kind of things. So UK has a similar issue where at the moment, the testing is only for the admitted, the ICU and the healthcare workers. The community testing was supposed to take off in the beginning of March, that did not take off. Um, I don't know the reasons for that. I'm not in the government for that. So um, it's going to take off eventually. Now, the, because we are testing the hospital, the hospitalized, admitted, the ICU and the healthcare workers and their family, so what you have is the pyramid we are seeing. So that number is small. So the mortality appears very high, but we do know if you start testing the entire community, that mortality will come down. So that's the difference between Germany and us where they're testing a lot more. So the overall mortal crude, crude fatality rate is quite low, whereas we are not testing everyone at the moment. But once we expand that, then you get a good feel of it. So if you go back to 2009, in 2009, when the whole influenza A virus H1N1 pandemic started, we thought the mortality is very high to start off with. And eventually it came down, 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 down. And after three years, when they did the serological assays, then we realized the mortality was down to 0.02 or something very small. So very, very low. That The whole community, when we test, then we get the correct picture. So we are not getting the correct picture right now in the United Kingdom because we are not testing the community. Over. And you want to talk about sensitivity. Yeah, yeah. sensitivity of the test. Yeah. Sensitivity of the PCR. Okay. Um, the current PCR, for example, what we have, the molecular wise, in a reaction well of five microliters, this particular, uh, where this original extract from the actual sample, it can go down to four RNA molecules per reaction. It is that that sensitive. Now, will this virus, viral nucleic acid, be intact and will it be inside the cell? Will it be in the throat swab or a nose swab? We don't know that. The reason for that is the virus transits through the upper respiratory tract, not necessarily all the time. Sometimes in the beginning, it just is there in the upper respiratory tract, maybe in some parts, but not everywhere. And usually they say by two or three days, it's everywhere in the upper respiratory tract. But we've had instances where the patient has gone to ICU with typical COVID symptoms and the upper respiratory tract is clearly negative. So we have a clear thing, just like what would you do in malaria? If a patient comes back from a country with endemic malaria, you would test with one film, you would test with a second film, you would test with a third film. So that's what we say. If you are not intubating the patient, first come by nose and throat swab. And if it's still typically of that, we do we ask them to send a re repeat sample. Quite often, the second sample, we do pick up. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't have a data on how many we pick up. We do pick up, just like malaria film, but the second or third sample like that, we do pick up. And the other aspect is we always ask for a deeper sample. If intubated endotracheal aspirate or bronchial lavage, even nasopharyngeal aspirate, we tend to get a lot more. In the pediatrics, however, we have a distinct advantage where the nursing staff and the junior doctors, they're all very well versed in getting a nasopharyngeal aspirate. I know you need to wear the FFP3, you know, all the protective gear. So because you're so used to that, we are a lot less likely to see false negative in the pediatric population because the samples inherently are very good. In the adult population, the adult team, be it nurses or doctors, they're not trained to get nasopharyngeal aspirate. So that's why the yield is a lot less. And there's a distinct difference between the American swabbing and the European swabbing. The Ameri Americans do nasopharyngeal swab, which is a thin wire goes through the nose all the way to the back of the pharynx and then comes back. It is very yucky. If you had it done once, you know it's a very uh, terrible thing to do. 
Whereas in Europe, we tend to do the combined nose and throat swab, where you take a th throat swab, back of the throat, and then we put the same thing into the nares, and then we get it out. And so there is a distinct, this is a totally different from the American one. So the publications that you get in the US, you cannot compare to what's happening here. So based on this, I would say that reaction per se is very sensitive. There are no parallel testing of combined nose and throat swab uh, and the bronchial lavage to see where the yield is. That call has gone out from the PHE virology cell last week for people to do combined testing. And we don't know the performance of assays that were done in China or Korea, how good those assays were. Uh, so I'll stop at that. We have to do have proper studies to see the false negative uh, rate. Over. Thank you. Uh, Kellum, two questions here. Um, are there different strains of for SARS coronavirus to uh, a two virus? And that explains the different presentation. Uh, and, and the second on the same thing, uh, do you think the virus can be eradicated with such a high infectivity rate, incubation period, asymptomatic carrier? Do you think virus is here to stay? So I'm, I'm going to be quite pessimistic. First, first of all, I, I don't think we've got evidence of uh, viral mutation causing different substrains within SARS coronavirus 2 at the moment. There, there, there is fingerprints where you can see that the virus has been acquired from different, uh, perhaps different origins of groups of people in different regions of the world. But these are more like fingerprints than a difference in strain that would account for disease severity. The SARS coronavirus is a very unusual RNA virus and it, it contains an error checking mechanism. So unlike influenza, this isn't a virus that changes a lot um, as it moves around the world. Um, now that's good news because that means that if we do get a vaccine, it probably will last, uh, the vaccine will be good for a large number of people because the, it, it'll stay effective because the virus won't be able to mutate very much. I'm sorry to say, but I don't think that this virus is one that we'll get rid of. We had, um, a, SARS, uh, we had a coronavirus come into the human population in the middle of the 19th century. There were a couple of a couple of what were thought to be influenza outbreaks at that time, quite severe ones, and it's quite possible that one of these was actually this coronavirus coming then. That coronavirus is now considered to be a trivial childhood infection from which we get lifelong immunity, but it continues to circulate. And my suspicion is that this virus will become part of our um, environment. We'll catch it in childhood and we'll not have to worry about it unless for some reason you don't catch it for the first time until you're much later in life or got immune suppression. So I, I think we won't get rid of it. My reason for saying that is this virus sits in the sweet spot where it has a seven day incubation period and a five or six day prodrome period. That's the prodrome is the time when people have mild symptoms. They may not realize they have disease. And during that time, they continue to uh, circulate in society. That's, that is if they're not doing as they're told and they're not staying at home. And that gives the virus opportunity to circulate. So I'm sorry, I am a bit pessimistic. I think that this one is here to stay. Thank you, Kellum. Um, Steve, th there's a lo lot of anger um, among the public and that's why uh, Zahi has asked, I think this question, why did the West not willing to learn from the East in terms of some of the strategies that worked in those countries? For example, Singapore, um, who learned a lot from previous um, SARS uh, epidemic. And, and why did the UK government not follow the advice of WHO with intense contact tracing or testing? Yeah, and um, so I do, uh, as part of my role at Imperial, and I, I also, I do sit on SPIM, one of the government committees. Um, we only look at epidemiological data and we only consider epidemiological issues. Um, this is a question and it's that we will consider at length for some time and it's a and it involves many different components. Um, the I think I would emphasize a couple of points. 
that um, uh, I lived in in Hong Kong and actually have a lot of work in China. I have a study site in Guangzhou. The attitude towards the control of infectious diseases in those countries is completely different than it is here. Um, in Hong Kong, when they had the first unlinked case, um, and the government said we're going to close schools, we're going to shut down government workers from home, um, minimum activity. Everyone was like, "Yep, I'm fine with that. Let's let's do that." Um, whether governments in Europe should or should not have said that at that very early stage is one question. The other question that I th I think we have to be honest with it ourselves is. What are the chances that it would have been accepted even had the UK government tried to do it at that stage? Um, I, I, I mean, even now, my sense is that the lockdown in the last couple of days has become slightly less effective. Ooh, sorry about that. Um, so, so I think that's. I think there are a number of elements to it, um, and and the question that the question will eventually be phrased as what would have been the earliest day. Um, that the UK would have wanted to or been able to do this. Um, and we won't be able to answer that for some time. Um, and I and I don't know the answer. I I will never be prime minister. There's, there are very good reasons I will never have to actually make that decision because I wouldn't consider everything in exactly the right way. Um, and it was it was very difficult for the people that had to make it. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, James, uh, James, you mentioned that uh, what could boost adherence to current recommendation. Could you give us an example of what is considered uh, anything we can do when practically advising adults in the ED? Yeah, so there's a there's a nice psychological model that that helps. Now, psychologists, we all have our favourite models and theories. Every psychologist has their own pet theory. There's thousands of them, but this is quite a neat one. Um, it's called protection motivation theory. And it says that if you want to get people to do a specific behavior, you need to think about, first of all, their risk perceptions. So the, the bad thing that might happen to them, what they think about that. And then secondly, what do they think about the behavior and the factors around the behavior. Um, and when you think about the risk perception angle of it, you're normally thinking about, do they think the bad thing is likely to happen to them? So the likelihood. And if it does happen to them, will it be severe? And those two things together are risk perception and they affect how motivated you are to do something. In the case of coronavirus, um, those two elements are already quite high. And among the population, we're already seeing quite high levels of motivation to engage in um, the, the various behaviours that are being recommended. So actually, I, I think adherence is actually quite high at the moment. Um, and the, the various things we might have seen, I think there might be other explanations for why, for example, car driving went up the other day that, that we can get into. But I think motivation is probably there. And what you might need to focus on instead to look at adherence is um, the more practical side of things around the behavior that you're recommending. So for example, if the behavior is stay in your home and try not to leave ha your house as much as possible, well, the practical implications on that are things like, um, but I need to go to work for money. And if I don't have money, I can't stay in my home. Or um, it's boring to be in the house. Or um, social contact, you know, I, I'm getting lonely and I'm not seeing anyone. And once you start to list out the various practical issues that are preventing people from adhering to the behavior, you can start thinking of ways that you can tackle those. So for example, if employees are furloughed, it's all very well and good saying that money will arrive in June, but that still leaves you a long time from now until June before you get paid. So there might be something around how can we provide resources to fill that gap? If it's social contact that's the issue, are there ways to provide support uh, remotely to people by contacting local charities, sorry, local charities or local support groups that can get in touch? Um, if it's boredom, maybe there are things that we can do about providing advice on uh, our hobby or online education or providing access to Netflix or something like that. You know, as soon as you start working out what the barriers are to engaging in the behaviors, then you can start thinking of practical solutions. And I think that's the key issue with adherence at the moment. It's less the motivation to do it, and it's more the practical barriers that are stopping people from doing what they think they should. Thank you, James. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, Sudhavna, um, 
Can I answer one question on why in the East they did it so well, especially the South Koreans? Yeah. Um, we, it has already been discussed, the South Koreans and the Taiwanese and the Hong Kong and Singapore, they had the MERS outbreak and SARS outbreaks, they're all geared towards it. When the Wuhan epidemic took off, the South Korean corresponding FDA, they called in the manufacturers and gave them the sequence, which was published on WHO on the 12th of January anyway, and they said, you have one week to validate, develop a test, one week, and they developed it. They had all the generic reagents produced locally in South Korea before the rest of the world anyway. And so they one week after that, they had a capacity of 10,000 per day. So that's South Korean example. Same Similar things happened in Singapore and other places. Now, what happened in UK is very strange thing. We had the assay in January. We had the reagents. Uh, everything was fine. We were preparing. Then the... Trump announced that all these big companies should shift their assays to them. So overnight, the big machines, the automated machines, which were supposed to where we were planning on testing here in a big way, we all had these machines for it. For example, HIV were alone, hepatitis C were alone. All these machines, the reagents for the coronaviruses, COVID-19, were taken to US overnight. And that was basically the existence of the companies. If they didn't, sorry, I don't know how politically right we should be, but that's what happened. So the companies were forced to take the reagents en masse in plane to US. So overnight, suddenly, we didn't have reagents for these machines that we were already for, you know. And the Germans started testing in a big way. So the German assays didn't come through. The Spanish suffered because the Italians made sure their kits are there in Italy and not exported. The French had a problem, so they didn't export their stuff anywhere. So suddenly, this whole concept of globalization of where things can move freely, and you know, they didn't have planes except for the cargo planes. So we had a issue of globalization where if you're not self-reliant, these reagents are not available for you, for your nation. And that's one of the things that we are correct, we are doing. So the reagents that we're getting, most of them are local and in UK, and we will get there. There is positive spirit in the way we are doing things. The exponential increase in the way UK is doing now, come a week from now or two weeks from now, we will be there getting the tests ready. I mean, we are already there in many of the hospitals now. It's going up more and more now. Over. Thank you. Uh, um, yeah, okay, okay, thank you. I think I've forgotten the question. Um, I'll find it and come back to you, Sadhana, soon. I think the next one, I'd probably let anybody answer it. I'm not sure who is the best person would be. Does the BCG, so there's an hypothesis that BCG protects against COVID-19. Um, what, what, what does our panel think about that? Sorry, I have to say again, please, over. Uh, does the BCG protect against the COVID-19? Um, I'm happy to say that I think that I, can, I can't see any biological reason why a BCG would give any protection whatsoever to, to this disease. Thank you. I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I was a clinical virologist before I went and did medical school. So I, I'm afraid I... Uh, I would be happy to ask others on the panel for their views as well. Over. I I have no knowledge at all of, so I wouldn't comment. Um, I have no knowledge that it offers any protection. I saw Dr. Sudevana offering to comment. No, I heard, uh, I heard uh, some papers being published. I need to see it because it's like this. Uh, I'm sure you guys probably would have talked about chloroquine, for example, same way. Unless there are correlations where if someone makes a comment uh, by multiple researchers, multiple trials, I don't think we should believe anything that's coming our way. Uh, there are people who say something for the 15 minute of fame, and I don't believe that. So, so everybody has become an expert on COVID now. Um, my wife is a surgeon, uh, now tells me more facts on this than I can and so and that's the way we, world we are living in so there was something on uh, 
uh, ibuprofen, and suddenly that became a big thing. Chloroquine, yes. Harrison's textbook of medicine says her chloroquine is good, but the, the paper, the article that came from France is flawed. You need to go into that particular article to see how good it is. And the Chinese in South China Morning Post said, chloroquine works, we have so much of success. I'm yet to see the actual data of the randomized controlled trial between the uh, positive effect of chloroquine and the negative effect of chloroquine or whatever side effects. Uh, I'm sure as part of recovery, uh, whatever trials that we have, we will get there, but uh, there are a lot of ifs and buts. So I'll stop in that speculative mode. Thank you. Thank you, Sadarna. The, the another um, social media commonly message seen is, uh, and uh, like uh, anybody from the panel answer that, how confident is the panel that the virus has crossed the species and was not invented in the lab. I'm very confident that it was not invented in the lab. That's very helpful. Thank you, Steve. This would be the most ridiculous biological warfare agent ever invented. Um, any, any, any mad professor that wanted to invent this would first of all have invented a, a, a vaccine first or would have invented a, a drug first. Um, I've also heard that it was engineered by the one of the popular uh, manufacturers of a phenolic based antiseptic because on the bottle it says that it can be treated for use, used against coronavirus and that this was put out years before coronavirus came on the market. But it's absolute nonsense. Um, there's numerous coronaviruses and just because it says so on an antiseptic bottle doesn't mean that there's a conspiracy. Uh, it Piffle. Yep. The genomics, it it if when they study the genome of the virus and compare it to things nearby, the most recent ancestors and the timing, it it all fits with the known mutation rates. It's it fits exactly within the naturally observed um related species in the way that it should. There is there is absolutely no evidence at all that it's a product of anything other than nature. Thank you. Um uh, there are lots of messages about PPE. Um, so in, in, in examining patients with uh, non-COVID um, uh, positive, um, what sort of um, measure should be wearing it? And, uh, and, and, and the second is after a long shift in ED uh, with or without PPE, what measure should be taken to possibly reduce the spreading to or spreading of COVID to our family members. Um, I'm happy for anybody to take this PPE question. Um, uh, the issue of PPE has become very emotive. There is now hard evidence of nosocomial transmission within hospitals. And that is no doubt a function of the breakdown of infection prevention control. But the PPE advice that's been given by Public Health England is based on best evidence. Unfortunately, it is incredibly hard to adhere to best evidence in all circumstances. And uh, this is the most highly infectious disease that we've seen um, since the near, near eradication of measles. Uh, it is at least twice as infectious as influenza from my reading. And um, unless one is scrupulous with not only PPE, but in the behavior that goes with PPE, then sadly, there is a very good likelihood of picking this virus up. As far as going home to your family, it's always going to be the same. Wash your hands. If you like, go for a shower. I like to go for a shower after a busy day on call. But washing your hands, um, as soon as you get into the house, in fact, we've got our gel station just outside the door of our house. Um, but then I've got, I've got daughters and they're filthy little things. Um, so, uh, yeah, wash your hands. That's all I'll say. Thank you. Uh, and Callum, I think you answered this question yesterday, but some of the people who have joined in may not be around for yesterday's so talk. Why are we seeing less infection or less severe infection in children? Uh, so we, we really, really do not know the answer to this question. It 
it, uh, th there's many hypotheses going around about uh, different immune systems, but that doesn't hold because many other infectious diseases such as influenza, respiratory syncytial virus and measles um, are, are quite capable of infecting young children um, who, who have robust immune systems, but they are naive. So children's immune systems are robust, it's just they're naive. I, I, I cannot believe that this is something to do with maternal exposure or uh, to other coronaviruses. It just doesn't make sense. I, I suspect uh, the more plausible explanation will be to do with receptor expression in the lower airways where the lower airways are, are not uh, fully developed. We know that giving uh, Losartan and Lisinopril uh, to um, animal models in the pregnant state uh, res re results in lung hyperplasia. And there's good evidence that uh, the ACE2 receptor is highly regulated in lung development. So a, a hypothesis, and it's only a hypothesis, there's no evidence to support it, is that differential expression of ACE2 receptor may explain why children who have not got fully developed lungs uh, are in some way protected. But it's only a hypothesis. Thank you. Thank you, Callum. Um, uh, so, Havna, um, with regards to the diagnostic, besides PCR, the isothermal nucleic acid amplification test has been rendered in some places as cost-effective and quicker analysis. The commercial companies, do you have any opinion on that? Yeah, yeah uh, plenty of opinions. Um, the PCR, the polymerase, TAC polymerase, originally was patented by Roche. So that was in the 1980s. So until about 2005, six, every PCR reaction we did, we had to pay royalty in UK to Roche for about 2.50 pence. So obviously this uh, made a lot of people unhappy. So in the 1990s, for the, during the HIV field, they developed the isothermal reactions like NASBA, which became TMA and SGA and uh, LUPAMP. So these are all variants where it's uh, there's no variation in temperature. So they're all isothermal, yes, technically, but they also pick up uh, the viral nucleic acid. So we like to put them all together in a group called nucleic acid amplification rather than PCR. I know PCR is the most popular of the lot, nucleic acid amplification. That's the technique wise. It's nothing special. It's just picking up a nucleic acid using another assay. So personally and also professionally, we don't care what kind of technique, as long as the nucleic acid is picked up and it works, the panel works, the sensitivity is good and the, it works in the field and it can be automated. And that's what matters. So for example, in the HIV field, there are so many fields, same with the chlamydia, trachomatis and the serogonera. So there's nothing special about isothermal amplification. They're all commercial, yes. Let it perform as well as a current assays, the PCR assays, that the WHO has recommended or CDC have or the ECDC or in UK or and then we'll talk about it and then that's the way forward. Over. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Callum, uh, Fiona uh, is asking a question and I think we have seen a, a, a child with this problem so I might just go to this. Uh, do you think that the obesity will turn out to have a role in a previously fit and healthy um, severe cases from the data which you have seen so far? I'm sorry, I had left myself on mute. Um, here we go. Yes, there's very, very clear indication that obesity has a role to play in uh, severe disease. Uh, here we see an, a, an adjusted uh, um, multinomial multivariate analysis of risk of death um, using clinical characteristics and obesity has the largest uh, size effect of, of, of any of the risk factors that's available. So obesity, neurological disease, pulmonary disease, uh, the largest risk effects. So definitely obesity is an important feature here.
Thank you, Callum. Um, and I'm not sure where um, Suzanne is, is a very practical question is there, but okay, I'll leave it for the Paris panel and you can pick up who's the best person to answer this question is, does anyone anticipate difficulties with the PICU bed capacity that would prevent children with comorbidities, uh, either cerebral palsy, neuromuscular problems, being admitted with COVID and non-COVID related issues? As, uh, as, as, as most of you know, the pediatric intensive care unit, most of them are being converted into an adult intensive care unit like ours, um, there are uh, from 16 beds, we've gone down to four pediatric intensive care unit beds and 12 are being uh, currently being cared for by an, uh, for the adults. So do we, do we anticipate that there will be difficulties with ITU beds for children with comorbidities like cerebral palsy, neuromuscular problems? Anyone? I, I I can't give a definite answer for the for the reasons that you've just mentioned. You said there's been reallocation of of beds, and it's a I think it's a fairly dynamic situation between um, pediatric and adults. But the projected demand is very uh, age focused. So if the current projections are right and the lockdowns work effectively, and we just manage to kind of stay within capacity for adults, then the corresponding demand from COVID for children will be you know, that much, much less, so vastly, vastly fewer expected PICUs for children. Um, but I can't give a definite answer. Thank you. Another one, Steve. When do you think we'll return to normalcy? Um, Ed, we might want to come back to Callum because I think he just he raised his hand. I was on on my view, so maybe ping back to him for the for the PICU capacity. I, I was going to support Stephen and say that of all admissions in the UK so far, less than 2% have been children under the age of 18, and very, very few of them have been uh, infants and children under the age of five. Those that have appear to have multiple comorbidities, and it's hard to tell whether they were truly acute respiratory distress from COVID or whether it was actually their underlying multimorbidities. So I think uh, the silver lining, if there is one to this outbreak, is that uh, we are not seeing very many sick kids and that they're not uh, coming to intensive care units. That said, there will always be isolated tragedies uh, and, and every child is a tragedy. Um, and then the question of return to normalcy, that's very uncertain. Um, if we do a very good job with the current interventions and we achieve reductions in transmission that are we're not going to be as good as as china but if we get close then we could hope to see similar rates of declining cases um and then i i think that we're uh, there are, there is an enormous effort now looking for innovation to support exit strategies uh it seems clear that testing uh very widespread rapid turnaround Test, repeat testing in the community is going to empower people uh, for lots of different case-based interventions. So, you know, quarantine, isolation, things like that. And then I, uh, I did hear a, a colleague from Oxford, Christoph Fraser, was on Radio 4 this morning um, talking about um, one possible option that might help, which would be a mobile phone-based um, instant contact tracing app. Um, it's very difficult to say exactly what the exit will look like, but I uh, I'm fairly optimistic, and I think with enough rapid testing, we will come up with good innovation that will allow us to get back closer to normal relatively quickly. But I can't say more than that. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, uh, James, um, and I, I thought, could I just quickly comment on the normalcy issue? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's I think it's also useful to think about what we mean by normal. Um, this is going to have ripple effects for quite a long time. So we need to also think about mental health impacts of what we're going through at the moment. Obviously, educational impacts for our children. The economic impacts of this are massive. And there'll be broader social impacts as well. Um, so I think even once rates of infection are under control, we mustn't assume that that is then automatically normal. 
And I'd also just flag that there may also be some glimmer of positive in some of this that we shouldn't also lose track of. How do we maintain rates of good hand washing into the long term? Because that's a good thing. Um, how do we stick with Zoom conferences rather than all of us jetting around the world to meet up with each other? There are other things that may come out of this. Now, at some point, someone needs to start thinking long term about some of these issues. Thank you. James, again, on similar two points. So I, um, I've got a six year old and I used to, um, I, I used to uh, say to him, there's a limit of 45 minutes on the screen time. And now to do the school work, he is on, on an iPad for a huge amount of time with it. So the impact of a huge amount of social media, watching news and, and screen time for all of us. And, and, and what do you think this will have a long-term impact, uh, both positive and negative in how we practice medicine future? Like um, all of a sudden we, I'm realizing the patients who are coming to clinic they don't need to come to clinic anymore. I could do some appointments over the phone. I can do some appointments via video very well. And then that saves time and efficiency both for the patients and the family and both for me. So, so but yeah. Yeah, I think, you're, I think you're right. I think this has disrupted an awful lot of the normal way that we do things. Um, and a lot of those disruptions are negative and we definitely, you know, that we definitely need to find ways to mitigate the harmful impacts but not all of them and some of them are allowing people to see alternative ways of, of normal practice that might have beneficial effects so for example the seeing patients um, with telemedicine techniques like you mentioned there are other things throughout society the um, video conferencing and the, the reduction in travel and increase in working from home may have longer term effects as well um, so there are there are changes this will definitely result in changes to the way society operates in the future um, just in terms of the, the screen time for kids, I have a 14-year-old and a 12-year-old and getting them off their phones anyway is a, an impossibility. So I think their screen time is now at least being productive rather than just chatting on their mobile phones to their friends. You've also got to balance the risks. So yes, normally we'd say try to reduce screen time, keep it under control. But if the alternative is just a massive family argument that goes on all day, then screen time is a good thing. Thank you. Um, um, given the, the alcohol gels are tra traditionally antibacterial, has it definitely been validated that it has adequate protection against COVID-19 spread uh, by, by extension of other viruses, especially as one cannot guarantee to wash hands every time uh, potentially con uh, contaminated? I'll defer to Dr. Sitavana. Uh, no, I wanted to answer the previous question on when will normal CD. So, hello, Atul, was a question to me? Yep, 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 yep. Okay, sorry, I missed that because I was on, my sound was completely gone. So is it the one on bacterial, antibacterial? I missed yes, that. Yeah, the, the hand gels. How effective so, are antibacterial hand gels? And the question is, is, if it's, is it effective? Uh, yeah, how effective are antibacterial hand gels against the coronavirus, given that they traditionally were antibacterial? Okay, uh, I wouldn't know. The only answer I would say is if it has 60% alcohol, it will be effective, okay? Uh, and uh, no antibacterial is actually antibacterial because if you put your hand out, there are something like a trillion environmental viruses which fall on your hand. If you put your hand out further, there's a billion environmental bacteria which fall on your hand. So your antibacterial gel will have all the bacteria in it. It is environmental. So it's not strictly antibacterial from a technical point of view. Yes, it will take away some of the bacteria, but the most important thing for this virus is the alcohol content. Look at it, if it is 60%, lot more than vodka, and then you have it, and that's the one to use, okay? Thank you. So, can I go back to the question on when the normalcy could be? Yeah. Because this is a technically a virologically pure one. I'm not 
at all thinking about the psychology or the effect of people or the social media or anything like that. If there is an Ebola virus outbreak, let's say in Sierra Leone or any of these places or middle of Congo, we say the outbreak is over when two incubation periods, that is 21 days into two, 42 days where we have, when we have no more cases. Right now, let's say in UK, we have an outbreak. Yeah, I know it's pandemic. The virus we know moves from pockets to pockets to pockets. Yeah, so we have an outbreak. So technically speaking, the outbreak will be over when two for two incubation periods, that is 14 plus 14, 28 days, we do not have any more cases. And then we can call it, it's over. Then we start with the cycle because we'll get an importation from some other pocket where people would have traveled. So we have to be vigilant. We need to identify these people. We got to contact trace and so prevent that pocket of one person bringing it in, expanding. So the new normalcy is we need to first get the outbreak over. The second normalcy is we need to be vigilant about this virus in the same way we're vigilant about be it Lhasa virus or Ebola virus or Marburg virus or Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus. And that's the only way we can control it and normalcy will come back. Over, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think all of us has read uh, two cases reported of reinfection, but how, how common is it? So my colleague had uh, COVID-19 last week. He's back at work this week. And, and, and for him, what is the risk of getting another infection again? I, uh, I don't think you can give an absolutely definite answer, but there's been a lot of debate about these data online and possible explanations for people going from PCR negative to PCR positive again. Um, and, and my reading of it and kind of observing various uh, virologists around the world is that given the most likely explanation is that um, shedding did persist in these people but was missed. Um, so they, they were actually, um, or that it could be cyclical, so they had low shedding and then went back to high shedding, but it's essentially these apparent reinfections are more likely to be one continuous infection. And, and the, the main rationale for that is just all of our knowledge about how we clear viruses without going into any details of the, <laughs> that we don't know about the precise immunological response, whatever that response is that drives down your viral load to such an extent you can get rid of it, would have to in, disappear very quickly to allow the environment for you to be reinfected. So. It's difficult to be absolutely certain, but m that's my understanding of, of the current consensus on interpreting those data. I, I would agree with that entirely. We, the, what we're taught in textbooks about the classic rise of uh, IgM and then IgA and the viral load going down and disappearing is a gross simplification. You have to remember there's a great degree of human variability and some people's early IgG response will not be as robust as others. So viral loads will come down and in our research we're showing people are swab negative by the traditional clinical methods but when we put them into sequencing we might find say five or six out of 30 amplicons will still be positive and then you have to think have they really cleared the virus or haven't they cleared the virus most of these people go on to be completely well and and so i, I think you have to think this is a this is you're looking at the tail end or the extremes of human variability um, in the great scheme of things it's not that important once the rest of the population has, has expo been exposed to the virus. But, but in the early days, we will see some people that appear to have uh, a recred we call it recrudescence is the fancy word to make ourselves sound clever. But it's really just the virus coming back up again. Thank you, Helen. Um, vaccine, uh, given that we are still, still are struggling with HIV vaccine, after uh, so many decades and investment with it, uh, how long do we think uh, the vaccine would be available? Uh, is it 2020 or are we looking at 2021? I, the people that are looking at this, so for example, CEPI um, are saying a year to 18 months is a reasonable time frame. Um, there are reasons to be optimistic. Uh, the main reason 
is that for MERS, um, especially in SARS, we had made good progress and there was evidence of being able to raise pretty good antibody profiles in animal models and that some of that technology does map, you know, this is very closely related to SARS and to MERS in some sense. So that some of the tech that's been used there can be mapped across, but we've never actually had a human, an effective human vaccination against the coronavirus. Um, my personal view is that we have never needed a vaccine or been as incentivized uh, to get a vaccine as we are for this one. So the sheer number of different options that we will evaluate in the next year is uh, will be higher than it's ever been before. So my subjective view is I'm optimistic, but um, I'm not sure whether anyone actually knows this or not. Thank you, Steve. I'm sure I don't know the answer to this question, but the paradox will be well, a difficult decision. Is, should, is this going to be a disease which we should deliberately not vaccinate our children against? Because it, potentially this could be a disease where childhood exposure to the live virus may give you a protective lifelong immunity. Whereas exposure to it in your mid 20s onwards, in particular mid 50s onwards, like me, uh, could actually be lethal. So it might be much better to catch it in childhood and have lifelong immunity than be vaccinated and have only five years immunity. Okay. So this, that's going to be the really interesting question for future researchers. Very interesting indeed. Um, the, the hot weather, we always traditionally seen the influenza rates going down when the summer starts, sunlight starts coming in. So do we think COVID-19 uh, will, infection rate will reduce as the hot weather and the high temperature, vitamin sunlight, vitamin D starts coming in? There, there is a little bit of anecdotal evidence that in warmer climates, it's not spreading quite as quickly. This is confounded quite a bit by reporting, but countries like the Philippines and Indonesia have had slower take off than we might have expected given their connectivity um, to China. And um, some people think that possibly Singapore are achieving uh, higher levels of control with, with less interventions, partly because it could have a slightly lower transmissibility. But I don't think it will be enough of a change to, to kind of, it will make controlling, it might make controlling it a little bit easier, but I don't think the climate effects in and of themselves will be sufficient to, to really drop the transmissibility down. Um, there's more work is needed on this and, and is certainly possible um, with good data across different latitudes. Thank you. I think um, for James, um, how long can the motivation be sustained with minimal practical support, mainly financial crisis, self-employed, may start working soon to pro provide support to their families. So again, I'd, I'd differentiate between motivation and your ability to actually engage in the behavior. So I think people are, are likely to be motivated to stay at home, but if they can't stay at home because they don't have enough money to buy food or pay the electricity bills or pay the heating, then they can't do it. Um, and I, I I don't think there's an easy answer to that. I, I think if, if no money is available to support people to engage in those behaviours, it will become very difficult for people to adhere to them, even though the motivation will be there. Thank you. Um, Callum, you mentioned yesterday about um, uh, co-bacterial infection with co uh, coronavirus. Um, if it is, what is the best antibiotics to cover? And, and, um, and, and, and does this change with the age of comorbid or comorbidities? I, I, as I said yesterday, we really don't know, but it wouldn't be a surprise if a proportion of people that are going to intensive care have got a bacterial co-infection with any one of the top three usual uh, pathogens, the streptococcus, haemophilus, uh, potentially staph aureus. There's been some scattered reports of aspergillus as well, but uh, we've had that before with influenza. So um, if it would be me, I'd be, I'd be going for the, the traditional um, uh, intensive care type combination antibiotics. Um, 
I think it's got to be up to local intelligence and local knowledge of the resistance profiles in these communities. But it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a big surprise to find that um, a significant proportion of those going to intensive care have got a bacterial co-infection. It wouldn't be a surprise. Thank you. Um, Self-isolation. I think UK uh, it, public health advised for seven days, but the WHO is advised for 14 days. Um, why is the difference? Anybody? Well, it's not quite as simple as that. What the, the UK government advice is, is self-isolation after, after resolution of symptoms is the key issue. So there's an expectation that you've already spent uh, at least seven days incubating and having a prodrome. So it's seven days after resolution of symptoms that you should be staying at home. And if you're a member of a household that's been, uh, been uh, in contact with that person, it is 14 days for isolation. So I think... I think it's just that we're giving a slightly more sophisticated um, uh, interpretation of this. I don't think there's a huge contradiction, but uh, happy to listen to others' views. Over. Thank you. Um, I think that's the optic flow. Um, um, children with asymptomatic carriers, is the situation, what is the advice about OptiFlu in children present with bronchiolitis who needs more respiratory support? Um, well, we're lucky that we're not in the bronchiolitis season yet, but no doubt we'll have this paradox in the coming winter. I've... <laughs> Optim Optiflow is often cited as been a wonderful uh, treatment for bronchiolitis. Um, if you look at the um, data from the Picanet survey in the UK, there's actually very little, very little to support a reduction in the overall numbers of children ventilated, despite the popular use of Optiflow. Uh, I, I can't say I'm a huge fan. I think I think it allows doctors to feel, allows, allows doctors and nurses to feel that they're doing something, but whether they're actually protecting children from mechanical ventilation is very hard to say uh, on a population basis. I think we all feel it's helped on the individual child it's helped. And then on the child that it fails, you think, well, they're going to fail anyway. Um, the infection control risk, though, going forward will be a worry for many. And um, I think we just have to put into proportion, remember that um, we're not seeing evidence of severe disease from COVID in the babies. The babies are unlikely to be severely affected, therefore. So if a baby has got bronchiolitis, it is more likely to be RSV than anything else. Um, hopefully molecular testing will, one of the, hopefully one of the benefits of this is that we will move away from the ridiculous process of centralising our, our virological testing, which is leaving even some teaching hospitals without a virology laboratory um, within the building and having to send swabs out and getting the result the next day. Um, so I hope, I hope that this will make, the value, will make a greater value for pathology laboratories so that we get quicker testing and a rapid turnaround and that can actually help us manage these patients. Over. Thank you. Um, I think we covered the nebulization medication yesterday, so I'll skip that. Um, Atul? Yeah. Uh, can I say something about uh, serology, which I promised earlier? Yeah, please do. Very careful when we introduce the serology tests, uh, especially the laboratory-based IEG and IgM. The strip-based tests are a different league of uh, complexity, which I won't go in now. The IgG test, we don't know whether if it's, let's say it's positive, whether that means it's immunity, whether it's a neutralizing antibody, like for example, hepatitis B surface antigen, someone has cleared it, the antibody that you see is a neutralizing one, or someone has been vaccinated, then the antibody that you see is a neutralizing one, yeah? 
Whereas hepatitis C antibody that we see in a patient is not a neutralizing one. Uh, it's just a res body's response to it. It does not respond, it does not neutralize. So if the IgG we detect, let's say the new ELISA, uh, whatever is going to come, enzyme immunoassays, it does not mean it is neutralizing. We need to see the evidence whether it's neutralizing or not. Then comes the added complexity. Does this IgG pick up the SARS coronavirus 2 generated IgG in the human body? Or is it a cross reaction to the common coronaviruses, which are four of them, HKU1, OC43, uh, NL63, and 229E. So we don't know the degree of cross-reaction. Let's say flabby viruses, you take the dengue virus IgG cross-react with the West Nile virus, will cross-react with yellow fever virus, which will, which will cross-react with tick-borne encephalitis IgG. In, in the same family, the IgGs actually cross-react. So uh, the, the tests actually cross-react, but so that is the problem we're going to have to interpret the IgGs when we have. Next comes the IgM. Does this mean the IgM, which appears, you know, in some nature publication, they say the, sen the sensitivity is maybe as low as 30% between the eight days of 3 to 10 from the time of onset. So we don't know how good this IgM will be. So does IgM mean it's purely for this, or is it going to cross-react with HSV-1 or HSV-2 or CMV? Remember, the patients are lymphopenic. That means there's a good chance that all the other viruses, they may, you know, if someone is in ICU, we know CMV, EBV, and HSV will, will reactivate. Then is the other problem. There may be bacterial super in, infection, which can lead to some other IgM. So will this IgM cross-react with all the other things? We know in the laboratory, just because an IgM is there doesn't mean it's diagnostic. It's at, present, at best suggestive. So we are going to go into an era when the evidence comes through. You have to get experience on the IgG and IgM according to the community we have, according to the age after the infection and then the time from the time of infection when the blood samples are taken. So we are a long way from actually getting the serology right. I'm, I'm hoping it will be very, very soon. Over. Thank you, Sudarna. Um, question for James. Um, how do we keep our workforce motivated when it's more becoming evident in the media that NHS is not providing adequate protection equipment? Well, I think the first step is that the NHS needs to provide adequate protection equipment. I think that's fairly uncontroversial. Um, I think there are there are other things to consider on top. I mean it, that that's you know fairly commonsensical that you need to have the right equipment to do the job. There are other issues at play as well. However, um, there was a nice paper out in the BMJ last week by a couple of colleagues, um, Simon Wesley and Neil Greenberg, talking about the concept of moral injury, which is a it's a concept that that actually derives from the military, where armed forces have to witness things or be unable to take actions that they think they should be doing in order to protect people. So the classic example is peacekeepers who are watching a war crime taking place, but their rules of engagement forbid them from intervening. So they just have to watch. Um, and that can be very distressing. So knowing that your moral code is to do something and you're unable to do that can be very upsetting for people and lead to mental health consequences. And unfortunately that, that, could be the situation that healthcare staff find themselves in, um, having to make these difficult decisions um, around treatments, um, which often staff wouldn't normally find themselves in the position of having to make. So there are issues around helping staff to deal with those kind of decisions and how to support them through that. And there are lessons to learn uh, from the military. So Simon Wesley and Neil Greenberg are actually um, they work in the King's Centre for Military Health Research and they're drawing lessons from those kind of situations into what the NHS workforce might be experiencing soon. Um, so I think there are, there are a whole gamut of other issues we need to think about on top of just PPE in terms of how to protect the mental health and the resilience of the workforce. And I think that's a, it's an important and interesting question in its own right. A lot of it comes down to uh, leadership and support from your line management. Um, as well as peer support for your colleagues and the ability to, to talk openly about what you've experienced, as well as then proper follow-up from mental health services afterwards. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, Sudhavna has to leave.
So I, I, thank you very much, Sudharna, for joining us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see you all. And, uh, and thank you for encouraging me to talk with the completely uncensored uh, comments. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll um, quickly go back. Um, Um, I think it, maybe James, you may be able to take this one. Um, at our trust, if a family of a, if a member of the family has symptoms, then the par uh, parent healthcare worker needs to move into a hotel and continue to work. Should we be, we be isolating at home? Am I risking my coworkers? You know, I'm not sure that is one for a psychologist to answer, to be honest. Okay, okay, sorry, James. Um, anybody else feel brave or I think it's outside the remit of the panel, if we say? I'm just trying to find the question. Sorry, can you say it again? Um, sorry. Um, I can't read it. I'm trying to get the nuance. Um, if at our trust, if a family, if, if a member of the family has symptoms, then the parent healthcare worker needs to move into a hotel and continue to work. Should we be isolating at home instead? Am I risking co-workers? I, I'm not, I'm, just, I'm sorry, I'm not picking up the nuance. So I think um, if, if somebody is symptomatic at home, uh, the trust is asking them to move them into a hotel and stay in the hotel and continue to go to work. Um, that, 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 does seem to, that does seem to be a, um, a, a very big ask of a family. Um, that doesn't seem to be entirely consistent with um, broader advice and broader intentions. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think we'll, we'll do five minutes more and then we'll close it. Um, there, there are a lot of cardiac complications like pericarditis, myocarditis has been reported um, in patients who are unwell from respiratory perspective. Um, is there evidence of that in, 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 in young children or in, in pediatric age group? I'm afraid I've, I've, I've not been able to dig into that level of detail but it is, some, it is a matter of research at the moment. We are, we are collecting that data and it is in our case report forms, uh, but, it, but it's uh, certainly in the pediatric population, it's not, not going to be a big feature because our numbers are so small. I think we almost done one and a half hours of the panel and I think um, I would probably close, I'll probably let the panel, has anybody, uh, Callum, Steve or James, do you have to say anything? Um, as a closing remarks. I think we're in for difficult times ahead. Um, I think pediatricians are a remarkable bunch of people. We provide great, great support and leadership to our staff. Uh, I wish you all well. Uh, wash your hands, uh, take care of your families and take care of yourselves. Thank you, Callum. I'll second that. Thank you, Colin. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, we'll make that unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much, Callum, Steve, and, and James, spending your time. I know all three of you are very busy in current environment. Spending one and a half hours was a, a really helpful. Thank you very much. Really appreciate. You're welcome.